Well, we're on to the second half of Chapter 41 in Little Women here at the Caribou Public Library. Thanks for joining us today for our chapter book story time. I'm Miss Erin, and we'll go ahead and get started. So Amy and Laurie had begun corresponding via letter back and forth to and fro, right? Fred Vaughn had returned and put the question to which she had once decided to answer, yes, thank you. But now she said, no, thank you. Kindly, but steadily. For when the time came, her courage failed her, and she found that something more than money and position was needed to satisfy the new longing that filled her heart, so full of tender hopes and fears. The words, Fred is a good fellow, but not all the man I fancied, but not all the, at all the man that I fancied you would ever like. And Laurie's face, when he uttered them, kept returning to her as pertinaciously as her own did, when she said in look, if not in words, I shall marry for money. It troubled her to remember that now. She wished she could take it back. It sounded so unwomanly. She didn't want Laurie to think her a heartless, worldly creature. She didn't care to be a queen of society now half so much as she did to be a lovable woman. She was so glad he didn't hate her for the dreadful things she had said, but took them so beautifully and was kinder than ever. His letters were such a comfort, for the home letters were very irregular and were not half so satisfactory as his when they did come. It was not only a pleasure, but a duty to answer them, for the poor fellow was forlorn and needed petting, since Joe persisted in being stony-hearted. She ought to have made an effort and tried to love him. It couldn't be very hard. Many people would be proud and glad to have such a dear boy care for them. But Joe never would act like other girls. So there was nothing to do but be very kind and treat him like a brother. If all brothers were treated as well as Laurie was at this period, they would be a much happier race of beings than they are. Amy never lectured now. She asked his opinion on all subjects. She was interested in everything he did, made charming little presents for him, and sent him two letters a week, full of li lively gossip, sisterly confidences, and captivating sketches of the lovely scenes about her. As few brothers are complimented by having their letters carried about in their sister's pockets, read and reread diligently, cried over when short, kissed when long, and treasured carefully, we will not hint that Amy did any of these fond and foolish things. But she certainly did grow a little pale and pensive that spring, lost much of her relish for society, and went out sketching alone a good deal. She never had much to show when she came home, but was studying nature, I dare say, while she sat for hours with her hands folded on the terrace at Valrosa, or absently sketched any fancy that occurred to her, a stalwart knight carved on a tomb, a young man asleep in the grass, with, this, with his hat over his eyes, or a curly-haired girl in gorgeous array promenading down a ballroom on the arm of a tall gentleman, both faces being left a blur, accordingly to the last fashion in art, which was safe, but not altogether satisfactory. Her aunt thought that she regretted her answer to Fred, and finding denials useless and explanations impossible, Amy left her to think what she liked, taking care that Laurie should know that Fred had gone to Egypt. That was all, but he understood it and looked relieved, as he said to himself with a venerable air, I was sure she would think better of it. Poor old fellow, I've been through it all, and I can sympathize. With that, he heaved a great sigh, and then, as if he had discharged his duty to the past, put his feet up on the sofa and enjoyed Amy's letter luxuriously. While these changes were going on abroad, trouble had come at home. But the letter telling that Beth was failing never reached Amy, and when the next found her, the grass was green above her sister. The sad news met her at Vivay, for the heat had driven them from Nice in May, and they had traveled slowly to Switzerland by way of Genoa and the Italian lakes. She bore it very well and quietly submitted to the family decree that she should not shorten her visit, for since it was too late to say goodbye to Beth, she'd better stay and let absence soften her sorrow. But her heart was very heavy. She longed to be at home and every day looked wistfully across the lake, waiting for Laurie to come and comfort her. He did come very soon, for the same mail brought letters to them both. But he was in Germany, and it took some days to reach him. The moment he read it, he packed his knapsack, 
bade adieu to his fellow pedestrians, and was off to keep his promise, with a heart full of joy and sorrow, hope and suspense. He knew Vevey well, and as soon as the boat touched the little quay, he hurried along the shore to La Tour, where the carols were living in pension. The Gardon, or Gar Garchon, was in despair, and the whole family had gone to take a promenade on the lake. But no, the blonde mademoiselle might be in the chateau garden. If monsieur would give himself the, the pain of sitting down, a flash of time should present her. But monsieur could not wait even a flash of time, and in the middle of the speech departed to find mademoiselle himself. A pleasant old garden on the borders of the lovely lake, with chestnuts rustling overhead, ivy climbing everywhere, and the black shadow of the tower falling far across the sunny water. At one corner of the wide, low wall was a seat, and here Amy often came to read or work, or console herself with the beauty all about her. She was sitting here that day, leaning her head on her hand, with a homesick heart and heavy eyes, thinking of Beth, and wondering why Laurie did not come. She did not hear him cross the courtyard beyond, nor see him pause in the archway that led from the subterranean path into the garden. He stood a minute, looking at her with new eyes, seeing what no one had ever seen before, the tender side of Amy's character. Everything about her mutely suggested love and sorrow, the blotted letters in her lap, the black ribbon that tied up her hair, the womanly pain and patience in her face. Even the little ebony cross at her throat seemed pathetic to Laurie, for he had given it to her, and she wore it as her only ornament. If he had any doubts about the reception she would give him, they were set at rest the minute she looked up and saw him, for, dropping everything, she ran to him, exclaiming in a tone of unmistakable love and longing, "'Oh, Laurie, Laurie, I knew you'd come to me!' I think everything was said and settled then." For as they stood together, quite silent for a moment, with the dark head bent down protectingly over the light one, Amy felt that no one could comfort and sustain her so well as Laurie. And Laurie decided that Amy was the only woman in the world who could fill Joe's place and make him happy. He did not tell her so, but she was not disappointed, for both felt the truth, were satisfied, and gladly left the rest to silence. In a minute, Amy went back to her place, and while she dried her tears, Laurie gathered up the salted, scattered papers, finding in the sight of sundry well-worn letters and suge <laughs> suggestive sketches good omens for the future. As he sat down beside her, Amy felt shy again, and turned rosy red at the recollection of her impulsive greeting. I couldn't help it. I felt so lonely and sad, and was so very glad to see you. It was such a surprise to look up and find you, just as I was beginning to fear you wouldn't come, she said, trying in vain to speak quite naturally. I came the minute I heard. I wish I could say something to comfort you for the loss of dear little Beth. But I can only feel, and he could not get any farther, for he too turned bashful all of a sudden and did not quite know what to say. He longed to lay Amy's head down on his shoulder and tell her to have a good cry, but he did not dare so took her hand instead and gave it a sympathetic squeeze that was better than words. You needn't say anything. This comforts me, she said softly. Beth is well and happy. I mustn't wish her back. But I dread the going home, much as I long to see them all. We won't talk about it now, for it makes me cry, and I want to enjoy you while you stay. You needn't go back right, right back, need you? Not if you want me, dear. I do so much. Aunt and Flo are very kind, but you seem like one of the family, and it would be so comfortable to have you for a little while." Amy spoke and looked, so like a homesick child whose heart was full, that Laurie forgot his bashfulness all at once, and gave her just what she wanted, the petting she was used to, and the cheerful conversation she needed. "'Poor little soul, you look as if you've grieved yourself half sick. I'm going to take care of you, so don't cry any more. But come and walk about with me. The wind is too chilly for you to sit still, he said, in the half-caressing, half-commanding way that Amy liked. And he tied on her hat, drew her arm through his, and began to pace up and down the sunny walk, under the new-leaved chestnuts. He felt more at ease upon his legs, and Amy found it very pleasant to have a strong arm to lean upon, a familiar face to smile at her, and a kind voice to talk delightfully for her alone. 
The quaint old garden had sheltered many pairs of lovers and seemed, un and seemed expressly made for them. So sunny and secluded was it that nothing but the tower to overlook them and the wide lake to carry away the echo of their words as it rippled by below. For an hour this new pair walked and talked or rested on the wall, enjoying the sweet influences which gave such a charm to time and place. And when an unromantic dinner bell warned them away, Amy felt as if she left her burden of loneliness and sorrow behind her in the chateau garden. The moment Mrs. Carroll saw the girl's altered face, she was illuminated with a new idea and exclaimed to herself, now I understand it all. The child has been pining for young Lawrence. Bless my heart, I never thought of such a thing. With praiseworthy discretion, the good lady said nothing and betrayed no sign of enlightenment, but cordially urged Laurie to stay and begged Amy to enjoy his society, for it would do her more good than so much solitude. Amy was a model of docility, and as her aunt was a good deal occupied with Flo, she was left to entertain her friend, and it did, and did it with more than her usual success. At Nice, Laurie had lounged and Amy had scolded. At Vevey, Laurie was never idle, but always walking, riding, boating, or studying in the most energetic manner, while Amy admired everything he did and followed his example as far and as fast as she could. He said the change was owing to the climate, and he did not contradict him, being glad of a like excuse for her own recovered health and spirits. The invigorating air did them both good, and much exercise worked wholesome changes in minds as well as bodies. They seemed to get clearer views of life and duty up there among the everlasting hills. The fresh winds blew away desponding doubts, delusive fancies, and moody mists. The warm spring sunshine brought out all sorts of aspiring ideas, tender hopes, and happy thoughts. The lake seemed to wash away the troubles of the past and the grand old mountains to look benignly down upon them, saying, little children, love one another. In spite of the new sorrow, it was a very happy time, so happy that Laurie could not bear to disturb it by word. It took him a little while to recover from his surprise at the rapid cure of his first and, as he had firmly believed, his last and only love. He consoled himself for the seeming disloyalty by the thought that Joe's sister was almost the same as Joe's self and the conviction that it would have been impossible to love any other woman but Amy so soon and so well. His first wooing had been of the tempestuous order, and he looked back upon it as if through a long vista of years, with a feeling of compassion blended with regret. He was not ashamed of it, but put it away as one of the bittersweet experiences of his life, for which he could be grateful when the pain was over. His second wooing, he resolved, should be as calm and simple as possible. There was no need of having a scene, hardly any need of telling Amy that he loved her. She knew it without words and had given him his answer long ago. It all came about so naturally that no one could complain, and he knew that everybody would be pleased, even Joe. But when our first little passion has been crushed, we are apt to be wary and slow in making a second trial. So Laurie let the days pass, enjoying every hour and leaving no chance, excuse me, and leaving to chance the utterance of the word that would put an end to the first and sweetest part of his new romance. He had rather imagined that the denouement would make place in the sh would take place in the chateau garden by moonlight, and in the most graceful and decorous manner. But it turned out exactly the reverse, for the matter was settled on the lake at noonday in a few blunt words. They had been floating about all morning, from gloomy Saint Gingoff to sunny Montreux, with the Alps of Savoy to, on one side, Mont Saint Bernard, and the Dent de Midi on the other, pretty Veve in the valley, and Lausanne upon the hill beyond. A cloudless blue sky overhead, and the bluer lake below, dotted with the picturesque boats that look like white-winged gulls. They had been talking of Bonavard as they passed, as they glided past Chillon, and of Rousseau as they looked up at the Clarins, where he wrote his Helois. Neither had read it, but they knew it was a love story, and each privately wondered if it was half as interesting as their own. Amy had been dabbling her hand in the water during the little pause that fell between them, and when she looked up, 
Laurie was leaning on his oars, with an expression in his eyes that made her say hastily, merely for the sake of saying something, "'You must be tired. Rest a little, and let me row. It will do me good, for since you came I have been altogether lazy and luxurious.' "'I'm not tired, but you may take an oar if you like. There's room enough, though I have to sit nearly in the middle, else the boat won't trim.' returned Laurie, as if he rather liked the arrangement. Feeling that she had not mended matters much, Amy took the offered third of a seat, shook her hair over her face, and accepted an oar. She rowed as well as she did many other things, and, though she used both hands and Laurie but one, the oars kept time, and the boat went smoothly through the water. "'How well we pull together, don't we?' said Amy, who objected to silence just then. "'So well that I wish we might always pull in the same boat. "'Will you, Amy?' very tenderly. "'Yes, Laurie,' very low. "'Then they both stopped rowing "'and unconsciously added a pretty little tableau "'of human love and happiness "'to the dissolving views reflected in the lake.'" And that is the end of chapter 41. We'll see you next time. <laughs>